The concept of cascading vision may be among the most powerful tools that we have for leadership in flow and the flow leadership framework. We combine the concept of cascading the VSPT, which again is vision, strategy, people, and tasks, and every area or level, I hate using hierarchies, but it's really tough not to, uh, there's an executive VSPT. What's the vision? What are the strategies? Who are the people that need to be on the team? And what are the tasks that they're going to do in order to lead and inspire the organization? And then you're going to have a senior management level, and that will probably include portfolio management, among other things. And they're going to have a VSPT as well. At the program management level and line management level, and product management level, they're in that third box, you're going to have a VSPT for all of those as well. And then if you use projects, uh, more and more companies are just skipping that and doing programs and putting the teams into programs instead. Um, the project will have a VSPT. Do we have a vision strategy for the project? Do we have the right people? And are they doing the right things? Then the team, of course, it's the same. Uh, do we have VSPT for the, for the team? And then individually, the individual, their personal vision and their personal strategy, their why for being there, all of this needs to align going back up the food chain. Okay. Now, the one thing, uh, we're going to talk about that in a few more slides, but that's basically the power of the one thing. And that one is where you, for example, one executive that came up with this, he was leading a very huge real estate empire that had grown to one of the largest real estate empires in the United States. And he did that by employing the power of the one thing. Each year, at the beginning of the year, he'd write down his 25 top initiatives of, if I did these 25 things, this would happen. And he would let that list sit for a couple days, and then he would come back and he would cut it by 80%. So he would take the top five. He would prioritize his backlog, his list, and put it in ranked order of value and, and would say, oh, these are the top five. If I did these top five, then this is what would happen for the organization. But the wisdom and the power of the one thing is, is that realistically, you're not going to do those five initiatives during the year. And so he would, he would once again, let it sit for a couple days, then come back and go, okay, of these top five, which is the one thing. If I did this one thing, it will have this exponential impact on our organization. And it worked. It really worked. He ended up uh, having just insane percentages of growth in his business year on year on year on year until he became one of the largest real estate agencies in the US. One of the things that we link back and we do this via using retrospectives with the team. Uh, we do team health checks, we do uh, flow friction analysis, uh, we use retrospectives a lot and from all of those, over time, about every three months, roughly, we would try for the team, at least. You know, individuals would give their one things back to the team. But from a team perspective, we were shooting for if there's this one thing that the executives could do for us, and they were able to do, it, do this for us in the next three months, that would enable our team to do X, Y, and Z. And so that's the whole concept of having the little bit of a wafer small domino knocking over bigger and bigger blocks as you go up the food chain. Now, as you're going up the food chain, if, if you're at the executive level and you've got 100 teams in one of the portfolios, 
You may or may not want to be looking at those hundred one things, but this is why you limit it to one thing, because otherwise, if each team came up with a laundry list of 10 or 20 items, you'd, you'd be looking at 1,000 or 2,000 items for maybe a single portfolio. The executives just do not have time for that. And so as it's going up the food chain, it needs to be filtered by the leadership as it's coming up so that they can help guide the organization in, okay, we've sorted through this list of 100, there's 10 left, they hand those to the executives and just say, okay, if the team's got these 10 things in the next three months, they would do X, Y, and Z. And then the executives can make an informed decision on that. Now there's always the risk that maybe the one thing that didn't get through going through that kind of filtering process is the one thing that you actually needed. So uh, I would almost uh, want the executive to see the whole list of 100 and start to get a feel for what it is that the teams are up against. Now, if you're wondering what BHAGs are, and that's there on the left, that's big, hairy, audacious goals. And that comes from Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. And it's, it's sort of a parallel thought to the one thing. When you're dreaming big and trying to achieve remarkable things, you need to have goals and objectives that are big, hairy, and audacious. A lot of times the executives will uh, hand us a flashlight and a spoon and point us to this cave that has a big, hairy monster in the cave with very sharp teeth and the monster isn't happy. And so by creating big BHAGs, you're really trying to address the uh, big, hairy, audacious goals, those monsters that you want to achieve and to win over. This touches right back into what I was just talking about, about unifying the vision of the team. And a lot of people... They may come from a Judeo-Christian ethics background, Protestant worth work ethics background. But they might not actually catch the root and the origin of this framework because in the original, it was actually applied in the negative. But because it's such a foundational principle, it works. And this actually, this part comes out of the Tower of Babel. Now, we live in a post-Christian West, both in Europe and the U.S., where people have totally lost touch with their roots. They still have a lot of uh, Judeo-Christian ethics that go through the culture through our cultures, but they don't understand the origins of that. And this is one of the most powerful, it's actually stunning, frameworks that comes from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And this is the Tower of Babel. Now, I really don't care whether or not you take it literal or you don't. Uh, that doesn't matter, and I really don't care if you if you're for Christians or against them, or you know, for Jews or against them. Uh, that's not the point here. The point here is this is ancient wisdom that is as true today as it was four thousand years ago. Human nature hasn't changed, regardless of how much our uh, technology has changed. If you see how people behave with themselves, uh, not much has changed in 4,000 years. But this one's really interesting. And this is, this is a framework that literally floated up off the pages of the, of the good old book. And they were building the Tower of Babel. And... If you've read the story of the Tower of Babel, you would know that uh, humankind was told to spread out and populate the whole planet. 
Instead, they hung together and built a city, and they started building a tower. So God literally came down, looked around to see what they were doing. He went, oh my goodness, these people are all speaking the same language. They're all of one mind. Anything that they propose to do, they're going to succeed. And if you've read the extra literature, the Tower of Babel was meant to allow humans access to the heavens. And they had uh, one third was going to go fight with the angels, another third was going to go fight with somebody else, and the other third take over. And uh, what was interesting, and that comes from extra biblical sources, it's, it's not there in Genesis, but... But what is in Genesis is God came down and he said, oh my goodness, look at this. They're speaking the same language. They're all of one mind. And anything they propose to do, they will succeed. That right there should stop everybody in their tracks. Because if you really listen to what was said, it's like, oh my goodness. They had a single vision. They were going to build that tower. They were of one language. And so at that time, according to the Bible, everybody spoke the same language. They were all of the, they, they were single-minded in their uh, desire to fulfill the vision and build the tower. And they were planned it, they proposed it, they planned it, and they were doing it. And it's interesting that God's solution was to confuse the language. So he confused the language of all the workers and they couldn't understand each other and that's where the word Babel comes from. It's also, I think, one of the roots for the word Babylon. But he confused the language. And if you ever get a project or if you ever get assigned to a project and you want to make sure it fails, the fastest way to help the project fail is to confuse the language, confuse the definitions, confuse the agreement, create a chaotic delivery, and guess what? You won't succeed. And so what was being applied in a negative way for the Tower of Babel actually becomes an incredibly powerful tool to unifying the vision for the team. That's why we spend a lot of time on definitions. We spend a lot of time on distilling agreement so that when we're delivering, everybody's able to focus and deliver and deliver great results. And then at the end of each iteration, we're double checking it to make sure that we're one step closer to the vision in the middle. So this is a very simple formula. One language plus one mind plus one plan equals the vision or one vision. And one vision is vision first. And if you want a team that is willing to throw themselves under the bus for each other, this is one of the key tools for doing that. And when the team starts to trust each other based on being of one mind, they're speaking the same language, they've got the same mind about what they're delivering, then doing the plan is like breathing. And you'll have a team spirit that is focused on the vision and it will become almost self-perpetuating. So this is a way to speak life using language and breathe life using one mind into the individuals and team members and the teams themselves. So this is incredibly powerful. And again, I really don't care if you like the source. The wisdom, the ancient wisdom that's coming out of this is so powerful and so profound that you can ignore this at your own risk. But we've been using this for 25 years and we know that this works. One of the things that Ted and I have emphasized down through the years is that flow is deceptively simple. 
but simple is not easy. If it were, each and every company would automatically be doing this. Our observation is they're not. Typically, when we show up, we see uh, confusion, friction, and underperformance. And then we use the uh, flow friction analysis to figure out what the source of the friction is. So don't be fooled by the simplicity of what we have because we have, we have distilled this and honed this and polished it for 25 years. And so what we make look simple uh, when somebody with less experience but has been trained goes and uses it, they'll go, oh, this is a lot harder than it looks. Okay, <laughs> now I get it. And so that's the other thing is it's, it's deceptively simple. It's not easy. And you will find that out when you try to take this knowledge out of our books, out of our training videos, and apply it in real life. This is, this is all great theory until you mix people in. And so this is both an art and a science. Okay, And we've distilled this framework and these models from the actual um, real-world fires of projects and assignments that we've been working on. So while we talk a lot about theory, this works. It's not simple. It is simple. And it's not simple at the same time. And it's definitely not easy. The pictures that we have in this series, uh, in this section, are were commissioned by Ted maybe five years ago or so. And we needed pictures to sort of represent what it is that people want and expect. And when we're looking at Agile, if you're a Scrum Master or an Agile coach, your leadership is expecting that you are able to part the water and help the team cross over the river on dry ground to the other side while being pursued by an army that wants to kill you. <laughs> and so uh, we look at this through four lenses, but basically uh, there are extremely high expectations on Agile, and Agile done correctly will part the waters for you. And you'll be able to do some amazing things and deliver some remarkable results that your leaders will step back and go, Whoa, whoa, what was that? Oh, wow, that was awesome. How did you do that? So uh, this is just one of the things of the four pictures. There's also you know, what our, what our uh, kids think that we do, or our moms, and then we're going to look at this plate spinner, and, and then the super agilist, okay? And so those are the four pictures in this series, and we use those in uh, juxtaposition with some of our concepts like the aha curve and the uh, four lenses on transformation, and uh, when you're plate spinning, that means you have to do the transformation in all four boxes at the same time. But I think you get the idea. These are the four lenses on transformation. Uh, I talk about these extensively in all of the other um, presentations and videos that we've done and uh, it's it comes from Agile Coaching Institute this is a modification of what they were working with and I was inspired by them and I like how this works it's individual team product program process corner and then portfolio uh, in the organization corner as well and this is how we view all of the many, many areas that you need to do, whether it's transformation, whether it's scaling, 
whether it's um, rolling out Agile to your organization or even governing Agile. You'll see various pictures throughout all of our presentations and this four box is one of the key ways that I use to communicate here's the four major areas that you've got to do everything in and you need to keep um, parting the waters for your individuals, for your teams, for the products, programs, processes, for the portfolios, and even for your executives. And so in a sense there is this expectation of you need to really be able to, you know, part the waters. I don't know if you saw the movie Bruce Almighty where he parts the water in the bowl. And, uh, well, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> okay. And so uh, it takes battle scars and skill in all four of these areas in order to be successful, whether it's just doing agile or being agile. Doing is the tool set view, being is the mindset view, and how to be agile. The second picture in this series is what our moms expect of us. <laughs> and uh, I don't think any of our spouses would agree that uh, we're necessarily having a halo. But the, the whole point with this one is, is that you need to not just talk the talk, you have to walk the talk. And uh, coming up the transformation curve, you don't become a saint overnight, okay? Uh, I don't know how many of you come from a Catholic background, but uh, to become a saint requires a high level of verification and you have to go through a whole bunch of hoops in order to be declared a saint. And going up the aha curve is almost the same idea where in the beginning you're struggling with the ideas and then you'll be going through the motions or sort of doing agile. At some point you're going to hit that aha and switch over to being able to perform. And so this is a transformation journey. And I think not only is this what every mom wants for their children, it's what every boss wants for their employees to be able to have that level of tra personal transformation in their daily work. 